It was on Sunday night, November 18th, 2012, when the future of the wrestling business officially arrived. No way! Amongst all the hoopla about Survivor Series and the War Games coverage last November, one thing I forgot to talk about was the 10th anniversary of The Shield, which is a pretty big deal, all told. There's no magic formula for success in wrestling, even with the best of intentions and promotions. So the fact that these three guys got over as a group, got over again as singles acts, and all became champions in their own right is quite frankly a very rare success rate. And now in 2023, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, and John Moxley have all cemented their status as some of the biggest stars of the era with seemingly lots of combined mileage left in the tank. These men helped change the face of not just the main event scenes in WWE and beyond, but really the whole tone of wrestling has been influenced by their work. Of these three though, this week we're focusing on Moxley, who spent nearly a decade under the WWE umbrella as Dean Ambrose. Moxley first came up in Ohio, training at the Heartland Wrestling Association, before making his way around places like Dragon Gate USA and IWA in Puerto Rico, before his die was ultimately cast in the deathmatch scene. As a fixture of Combat Zone Wrestling, he fought in brutal, bloody affairs against guys like Nick Gage, Drake Younger, and Jimmy Jacobs, not exactly the resume of a future WWE champion. By the standards of the company that Moxley entered when he first signed in April of 2011, and given his background, there is perhaps no less likely a candidate to have climbed to the top of superstardom in years. Though he had a strong work ethic and an undeniable charisma about him, that history in death matches made him seem like the polar opposite of what Vincent Mann wanted in his stars. Even CM Punk and Brian Danielson didn't do that stuff. But like how he used to do with that clothesline of his, Moxley was always able to bounce back and prove his worth, before eventually throwing his hands up in frustration and leaving in 2019. So where did things go right and where did things go gloriously wrong? Walk with me along the jagged edge known as Dean Ambrose's WWE journey. It wasn't long after he started out in FCW that Ambrose was being told that something good would come along soon to help get him to the main roster. That something good came in the form of a hardcore legend. All the 14 year old kids ruin their lives. Their name one, on name one 14 year old kid. Nick Foley had re-signed with WWE soon after Ambrose arrived in FCW and he even threw down the 2012 Royal Rumble match. A plan was in motion for Foley to wrestle Ambrose at that year's SummerSlam and it all kicked off with a confrontation in a hotel lobby during during WrestleMania weekend. Ambrose, in character, confronted Foley in front of a crowd of onlookers and accused him of ruining a generation of wrestlers with his violent antics. Ambrose's delivery, Foley's response, and the shaky cell phone camera made the whole thing feel very real. Even some of the boys believed it, as Mark Henry famously declared he would beat up the guy if he ever saw him, not realizing he was actually sitting next to him at that moment. It felt like there was a lot of potential in this angle. If there were two defining traits of Mick Foley's career, it was the amount of abuse he put his body through and how hard he works to elevate and legitimize younger opponents. Apparently some heated form between the two when Ambrose would mention Foley's family in promos much against Foley's wishes. The two would smooth things over just before medical science reminded us that it wasn't 2004 anymore. Foley had failed the company's newly instituted concussion protocol, putting a sudden end to his in-ring career and shelving this potentially hot storyline with it. Ambrose kept plugging away in FCW and even had a feud with Commissioner William Regal, culminating in a match on the final FCW broadcast. And a short, sweet seven months later, he finally got the call. This will probably blow some people's minds and then some people will be like, oh, you're full of shit. Uh, the Shield was my idea. Oh, wait, am I in legal trouble if I post that? While CM Punk was in the midst of his 434-day reign with the WWE Championship, he had the idea for a group of heaters to back him up. Punk's original choice for the threesome was Ambrose, Seth Rollins, and Chris Hero. But in a real timeline-altering moment, WWE nixed Hero and put in Leaky, the wrestler who would soon be known as Roman Reigns. The Shield made their debut at Survivor Series 2012, destroying Ryback with their soon-to-be signature triple powerbomb through the announce table. According to legend, the three were supposed to come to the ring brandishing actual riot shields to really hammer the point home until Vincent Mann told them to ditch them because it looked stupid. I've spoken a lot here about the Nexus, how they could have succeeded, why I think they failed, but the more I think about it, the real problem that they had going against them was that they had too many members. It turns out three is the magic number. That and wearing tactical gear, I guess. 
Unlike their spiritual developmental predecessors, the Shield got over in quick fashion by continuing their assault of beloved top figures without comeuppance, including John Cena, Randy Orton, and The Rock. Unlike so many other times where a new act would come in hot only to fizzle out within a month, WWE was clearly into protecting our three heroes with a unique entrance, a three-point offense with wildly different styles, and a license to look strong at all times. Weeks of run-ins led to a successful in-ring debut against Daniel Bryan, Kane, and Ryback at TLC that December. The also tried to cost The Rock his WWE Championship match against Punk at the Royal Rumble until Vince restarted the match and The Rock emerged victorious. Soon after Punk's historic reign had ended, the Shield's connection to the Straight Edge Superstar had disappeared, meaning our boys are going to do their own thing for a while. Despite some early hesitation from those at the top of the food chain, the Shield completely reinvigorated the in-ring product on Raw, engaging in excellent tag and singles matches nearly every week. They beat Cena, Ryback, and Sheamus at Elimination Chamber, and the team of Randy Orton, Sheamus, and Big Show at WrestleMania. Even The Undertaker won in on the action, as fans got to see during a post-WrestleMania tour of the UK that saw the Justice Hounds powerbomb the dead man off TV for a while. Taker apparently got hurt for real in that exchange, but if that's true, the Shields pushed didn't suffer for it. And with all those victories, naturally, came championships. Reigns and Rollins would win the tag titles, and Ambrose would beat Kofi Kingston to become the U.S. champion. Dean would go on to have one of the longest and most boring runs of the belt in all its history. Seriously, he had the belt for 351 days, and I think he defended it on TV maybe four times before he lost to Sheamus in the Battle Royale. Was the title rank cursed? I don't know, you tell me. It did start on May 19th. May 19th. May 19th. In fact, The Shield didn't suffer their first loss as a unit until the following month on the June 14th SmackDown to Orton and Team Hell No. If it seems like a totally random day for something that big to occur, well, you'd be right. I mean, consider the company we're talking about here. As spring turned to summer, the Shield became satellite members of the Authority, doing Triple H's dirty work in the name of what was best for business. The boys would soon absorb a big one-two punch from the Rhodes family, losing a three-on-two match against Goldust and Cody where their jobs were on the line at Battleground, then again the next week when the brothers beat Rollins and Reigns for their tag straps. That handicap match was awesome, by the way, one of the few emotional high points during the Authority's time in power. It was also a real full-circle moment for Ambrose, who considered Dusty Rhodes one of his biggest mentors in FCW. As the months went on, the Shield's once unkillable mystique began to show some cracks. Though Dino would brag about being the only team member to still have a title, he was often the one taking the fall when the team lost. Tensions came to a head in February of 2014 when the Shield crossed paths with a mystical Wyatt family in a rip-roar and badass couple of matches that really showcased all six men as potential future flag bearers of the company. Honestly, the fact this feud didn't get a WrestleMania match to me was kind of disappointing. I mean, would have been a better deal than what the Wyatts actually actually got that year. Mania 30 was still a good one for Ambrose, Rollins, and Reigns, who trounced Kane and the New Age Outlaws in a squash match. The Shield wrapped up the first four months of the year in a big way, breaking away from the authority and beating the reformed Evolution in two straight pay-per-view matches at Extreme Rules and Payback. Yes, things were truly on the upswing for the faces that launched a thousand fanfics, but with Batista going back to Hollywood and champion Daniel Bryan suffering injuries that would shelf him for the rest of the year, the time had finally come for the Shield to break away into three solo acts. Oh my God! When Seth Rollins bought in and joined up with the Authority, he and his other two teammates immediately diverged into three distinguishable personae. Rollins was portrayed as a sniveling sellout, Reigns was seemingly above it all, while Ambrose was the crazed and jilted friend out for revenge. Though it was already pretty clear before the split, it was very obvious now that Roman Reigns was the new chosen one in WWE, but the way they went about that just didn't feel right. Even though Roman was betrayed just the same as Dean, he seemed to just shrug it off and go on his merry way for a bit, while Ambrose seemed intent on taking the whole authority down by himself. Ambrose and Rollins had both adopted new looks, while Roman Reigns has stayed in shield mode for the next mm, several years. Ambrose kind of looked like a fool for trying to fight Seth and the authority, and Roman seemed like a dick for never running in to help his former S.H.I.E.L.D. brother. Ambrose made Seth's life a living hell for those first few months post-betrayal, beating him up, rigging Seth's money in the bank briefcase to explode with slime, coming to the ring with a hot dog cart. See, there were a lot of comparisons at this time between Dean Ambrose and Stone Cold Steve Austin for the way Dean was terrorizing the authority, but I don't know, it seems like Austin's hijinks against Vincent Mann were a lot more devastating than these little pranks. Maybe the comparison would have been more appropriate if Stone Cold had drank Surge instead of Steve Weiser's. Despite 
the somewhat goofy elements, the fans were still very much invested in this feud between them as Seth and Dean had great chemistry together. But for whatever reason, WWE seemed intent on keeping Dean just one or two levels below Seth and Roman in the hierarchy, and his win-loss record during this time seemed to reflect that. From the Shield's breakup until the rest of the year and beyond, Dino the Machino failed to win a single pay-per-view match, and that guy was on all of them. His blood feud against Seth was a completely one-sided affair in favor of the Authority's Golden Goose, though it was a series of awesome matches. His final loss against the Architect, for the time being at least, was in a Hell in a Cell match, where Dean inexplicably lost via interference by Bray Wyatt and his buddy, Spooky Projection. Ah, now there's a feud that benefited neither man. Much like his program with Seth, Dean lost every major match against the Eater of Worlds over the course of several months. He did beat Bray in a boot camp match on that year's Tribute to the Troops special, but as we all know, that show is pretty much non-canon. You know, like house shows, or main event, or the first couple of Saudi Arabia shows. But the biggest and most laughable way to lose had to have been at December's pay-per-view offering dubbed Tables, Ladders, Chairs, and Stairs. When Dean grabbed the TV that blew up in his face because he failed to unplug it, causing him to thrash around like he got stung by a million invisible bees as he got pinned. Like I mentioned, this rivalry didn't help either guy. It made Dean somehow look weaker and dumber than he did against Seth, and how's beating that guy supposed to help Bray's career when he barely had any major wins of his own? Ambrose lasted about 14 minutes in the 2015 Royal Rumble match before becoming one of the big show and Kane's many victims. Roman Reigns would go on to win that match in an ending that was famously loved by all. Then Dean came up short in Intercontinental Title Feud versus Bad News Barrett. At WrestleMania 31, he was one of seven men in a ladder match that ended with Daniel Bryan winning the IC title, one of his last matches before his first retirement. Oh yeah, and what were Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns doing at this show? Oh yeah, taking part in the main event. By constantly booking him to lose, often due to his own incompetence or hubris, it really seemed like WWE wanted you to stop cheering for him. And the fact this was happening at the same time they all but moved heaven and earth to get fans to cheer Roman wasn't a coincidence. In Vincent Mann's eyes, if you weren't a babyface who won all the time, you had to be a babyface who lost all the time. Hey, it worked for Daniel Bryan, and that totally wasn't a miserable slog to get through as it happened, right? Let's do that all over again, this time with props. Ambrose didn't win a single pay-per-view match until Extreme Rules in April, nearly a full year after The Shield broke up. It was a Chicago street fight versus Luke Harper, aka Brody Lee. This match was very entertaining and broken up into multiple parts. As the pair drove off early in the show, then came back later on to finish it. I mean, hey, fighting in and simultaneously hijacking a vehicle mid-match, that is some serious business. That really shows your own do whatever it takes to beat your opponent. But hey, rules are rules, right? I mean, the fall takes place in the ring. Ambrose was still a main eventer when they needed one, failing to beat Seth for the WWE title on several instances in mid-2015, including in a ladder match at Money in the Bank in his home state of Ohio. Once Rollins was forced to vacate the title due to injury, Ambrose made it to the finals of a tournament at Survivor Series before losing to Roman before Sheamus swooped in with his briefcase. WWE seemed to have finally figured out how to portray Roman when he won the belt back about a month later on Raw, then they immediately fumbled that again at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view. A showdown between he and Triple H for the title at WrestleMania was inevitable. But boy, they sure loved teasing us along the way, didn't they? For starters, Ambrose was the last one eliminated in that Rumble match that saw Triple H win to become the new champion. He dropped the fall in a number one contenders match at Fastlane involving Roman and Brock Lesnar. Then with one final twist of the knife, he lost again while challenging Triple H at the first ever Roadblock event that March. The fans were practically begging for the promotion to surprise them, but all they ended up doing was further lower Ambrose's stock. So, perfect time for a match with Lesnar, right? A no DQ match was set for the two of them at Mania 32, and like a lot of things that night, this too fell well short of expectations. Ambrose had envisioned a brutal affair in Dallas. His promos during the build with guys like Terry Funk and Mick Foley seemed to indicate it was going in that direction, but Brock was having none of it, electing for a safer match to avoid risking injury as he was scheduled for a UFC fight soon after. Sadly, the match fell flat and Ambrose predictably ate the pin, but one thing that was kind of entertaining and funny having been there live was that they would throw up a counter on the giant screen at AT&T Stadium for every German suplex Lesnar hit so the crowd could count along with it. I wish I was making that up. 
Dean soon pivoted to a feud with Chris Jericho, who he took out in the Rumble match earlier in the year. This feud was definitely a mixed bag. It resulted in a pair of fine pay-per-view matches, including the Asylum match, and no, I don't mean they wrestled at the Nashville Fairgrounds. This weaponized cage match even saw Y2J splat onto thumbtacks for the first time ever, and amazingly, Dean won the program in dominant fashion. On the flip side, it also gave us one of the all-time lamest ideas for an interview segment in the Ambrose Asylum, as well as Mitch the Plant, Dean's unofficial sidekick and companion? Hey man, I also loved Al Snow and Head and Perry Saturn and Moppy, but there's a ceiling to that kind of gimmick, okay? Like, hey, we know Dean's crazy, let's just leave it at that, all right? It took long enough, but Mr. Fringe had finally gained some traction as he was headed toward the high point of his career. Fast forward to Las Vegas, Money in the Bank 2016. Ambrose beat out five other men to win the coveted briefcase, then at the end of the night used it to cash in and defeat Seth Rollins to finally become WWE Champion. After more than a year of taking loss after frustrating loss, Dean finally got one over on his hated rival at the most opportune time, making history as all three members of the Shield held the gold on one night. Being there live, it was insane to watch. To be in the crowd, to witness all that chaos, it was so fun to watch him achieve this big accolade and for him to finally reach the top of the mountain, a mountain that would soon be cut in half, leaving two smaller mountains. Right as Dean became the sole champion, the WWE brand split was reinstituted, and Ambrose was now champion of just half the roster, creating the need for the Universal title on Raw. Ah, so in kayfabe, we can kind of blame Dean for one of the most disappointing moments in WWE history. But before the split became official, the three former brothers fought for the title at Battleground, the first and only time these guys wrestled in a triple threat match. But for as epic a match as this was on paper, something was missing from the build. You know, just one of the three participants, no big deal. Just days after Money in the Bank, Roman Reigns was suspended for his first wellness violation and had to sit out for 30 days, coming back just two days before the pay-per-view. For the next several weeks, Ambrose and Rollins had to work a little bit harder to sell this match in Roman's absence, and they had to tap dance around the reason he was MIA in the first place. Roman still got his spot in the main event, but in the end, Ambrose walked away the winner. It was some major validation for Dean as champion. Any worries that his victory was a fluke were suddenly out the window. Yes, things were finally looking up for Ambrose. So, who is his first program going to be with in this new and improved SmackDown? Ah, damn it! Don't get me wrong, Dolph Ziggler is great, but this was in 2016, not 2011. The window of opportunity for Dolph to be taken seriously as a world title contender had long passed, and he was sadly calcified as mid-card for life. It wasn't too hard to predict how this one ended up, as Ambrose beat the Zigmeister at SummerSlam. I mean, wow, what a great first chapter in the main event scene for SmackDown in this new brand split, right? I mean, it felt like the company had this pathological aversion to letting Ambrose succeed. Then again, the champ didn't do himself any favors yeah so uh when i was in like elementary school like uh you know like at the time though i just was just like the first iteration of the Stone Cold Podcast on the WWE Network ran for three seasons, but in my opinion, it was Dean Ambrose's interview on August 8th that led to its brief absence because, whoo boy, it stunk. For the duration of the hour-long interview, Dean had the energy and body language of someone who would rather have been anywhere else. When he wasn't being boring, he was rambling as Austin had a hard time finding a good angle to keep the conversation moving along. That's when the Texas Rattlesnake caught his guest off guard. Right now, I, I don't consider myself a chip on my shoulder guy because Dude, I, are you saying you're complacent you've lost your edge because you've got that championship belt i would dare say you've rested on your laurels you're a little bit comfortable and you need to find the edge again give it to me give it to the people I feel like you put me on blast a little bit and i you know i get the distinct impression from watching this that dean might not have known what he was getting himself into while austin was clearly frustrated that dean was showing no energy and emotion and was trying desperately to get something out of him there were also a couple of points where dean called austin out for some of his research being incorrect which i'm sure stone cold didn't appreciate either this was the wwe champion and that's how he presented himself i mean if i'm being honest i'm kind of surprised he didn't drop the belt at SummerSlam after this later at the Backlash pay-per-view, AJ Styles shocked the world when he beat Dean for the title, ending his run at a whopping two defenses. The lunatic fringe spent the next couple of months chasing the gold, but I don't think he or anyone else could have predicted the impact of a force far greater than either he or Styles. Ellsworth Mania. 
Yes, folks, it's time to talk for a bit about James Ellsworth, the most out of nowhere success story of 2016. A fleeting appearance as fodder for Braun Strowman somehow led to this awkward, chinless enhancement talent receiving a recurring bit part and eventually a full blown contract. So naturally, why not make him a vital component to a world title program? Ellsworth spent the next several weeks as a buddy slash pawn for Dean in his quest to frustrate Styles on their way to the rematch at TLC. When watching this, I felt like Ellsworth was being booked similar to Eugene in the mid 2000s if Eugene's character was bad at wrestling. Ellsworth possessed the same naivete and cluelessness that Eugene did. Both also kind of dominated their respective stories over the much bigger stars. But at least Eugene's gimmick was he could often wrestle circles around his opponents. Also much like Eugene, James was susceptible to the dark side and helped AJ retain at the pay-per-view. Though, is it really a heel turn when the guy turning heel is too dumb to know what he did? Jimmy Jam would learn a lesson from both Ambrose and Stylus before tumbling down the card to manage Carmella as Ambrose would go on to win the inter title from The Miz on the first SmackDown of 2017. Dean spent most of this time defending the title on the house show loop and wrestling dark match main events after SmackDown went off the air. While on TV, he was mired in a feud with Baron Corbin over the belt that peaked at WrestleMania 33's kickoff show. That's right, the guy who wrestled Brock Lesnar at last year's WrestleMania and who was just WWE Champion six months ago was stuck in a program with wrestling's equivalent of a sleeve of saltines plopped onto a charcuterie board that didn't even make the main show. And let's check back in with Seth and Roman to see how they did at that year's WrestleMania. Ah, there we go. Dean was drafted back to Raw soon after Mania, where he'd resume his feud with The Miz and drop the belt back to him at Extreme Rules in June. That feud was best known for giving us the golden duo known as The Miz Taraj and Dean in a bear suit. But soon after that, a real money-making angle was headed his way as The Shield was set to reunite. Rollins had turned face in the midst of his feud with Triple H and wanted to mend fences, trying for weeks to regain Ambrose's trust and no avail until the two found a common enemy in Sheamus and Cesaro. This two-thirds reunion resulted in another great series of tag matches as Rollins and Ambrose would win the tag belts from the bar. Pretty soon, Roman joined the fold and everything was set. Huh, wonder what that could be. Ah yes, TLC 2017, a particularly cursed show thanks to a meningitis outbreak that took a few folks off the card at the last minute, including Reigns. The much-hyped SHIELD reunion was tweaked to Rollins, Ambrose, and GM Kurt Angle dressed in SHIELD cosplay and wrestling his first WWE match in 11 years as they beat Braun Strowman, The Miz, and The Bar in a handicapped TLC match. But Roman came back soon after, the band was back together, and now that big reunion could finally come back in full of... Ugh, what now? Oh! After working a grueling schedule unmatched by anyone else in the company at the time, Dean went down with a triceps tear that put him out of action for nine months. Though he might have come back sooner were it not for a near-fatal MRSA infection he suffered after the initial surgery. Boy, some guys have all the luck. Now fully healed and looking real jacked, baby, Ambrose came back to WWE in the summer of 2018, and in just a short while, the reunion was back on again. The highlight of this third attempt took place at Super Showdown in Australia, when our boys beat the team of Dolph Ziggler, Drew McIntyre, and Braun Strowman in a six-man. Because 50-50 booking is the name of the game, The Shield would lose a rematch to the same team just two nights later on Raw. The thing... Whoa! <laughs> that was close. Not gonna get me this time. Oh, God! On the October 22nd, 2018 episode of Raw, Universal Champion Roman Reigns announced that his leukemia had returned, and he relinquished the title he had spent months chasing in order to take care of his health. The lads shared an emotional fist bump on stage. Then at the end of the night, Dean and Seth would regain the tag titles, only for Ambrose to immediately turn on Seth and become a heel again for the first time in years. But don't worry, Dean's character was gonna be much different than when he was a face. See, before, they gave him a lot of goofy crap to work with, but now they gave him a lot of dark, uncreative crap to work with.
In a run of creative that almost seemed like they were trying to get him to quit, Ambrose burned his shield vest, saying being in the group had made him weak. He started wearing a gas mask to the ring because the crowd smelled so bad. He even got publicly inoculated against what he called the fan's illness, a moment that comes across a whole lot differently now than late 2018. On at least one occasion, Dean had to shoot down a line that was written for him where he would heal on Roman for having a deadly disease, so good on him for standing his ground. Dean would beat Seth for the Intercontinental title in this feud, but unlike his gargantuan reign with the U.S. title, this one only lasted a month before he dropped the belt to Bobby Lashley in a triple threat also involving Rollins. The heel turn and the ensuing terrible material he was given made Ambrose realize it was time to escape Papa Vince's nuthouse, and soon after the 2019 Rumble, he gave his notice that he would not be renewing his contract once it was up in April. And to further drive the point home, the announcers actually confirmed it on the air, which I don't recall them doing for anyone except maybe Bret Hart. Guess they really want to let everyone know that Dean was going to be a lame duck for a while. Give them credit where it's due. WWE did try to sweeten the deal with Ambrose, apparently offering him a hot dog cart full of money. Then they tried to embarrass him by having him beg off during a confrontation with Nia Jax on Raw. Then once they realized he wasn't going to resign, they decided to say fuck it and bring the Shield back together one final time for a match at Fastlane, then on a network special before his contract was up. By the way, how did they explain away Ambrose's betrayal of Rollins and all that stuff he said about the fans being diseased and smelly. Uh. Yep, that is about the level of competence and care that I would expect at this point. The final weeks of Dean's time in the company had him in a familiar role, that of a chronic loser. He got his ass kicked by Drew McIntyre on a weekly basis on Raw for a while. Then on the night after WrestleMania 35, Dino's final moments had him standing up to Bobby Lashley and defending his wife Renee Young's honor. When you're gone, I'll make sure to take care of your wife for you. Man, between this and Lana later in the year, Vince really wanted Bobby Lashley to go after blonde married white women, didn't he? Add that to his list of kinks, I guess. I, I can see the, the moral fabric of, of America disintegrating right before my very eyes. Of course, Dean was pulverized by the Almighty and was slammed through the announce table mere feet away from Young, who I'm sure loved having to walk a verbal tightrope about her husband every single week on commentary before his departure. And that was the rise and fall of Dean Ambrose in WWE. Now, it can be argued from the perspective of things like pay and screen time and the accolades he achieved that Dean Ambrose was treated relatively well by WWE. But once you look past that and comb through all the crap and begin to look deeper, you have to ask yourself, was he though? Though he achieved a level of success attained by very few in the business, the fact that his run still felt like a frustrating disappointment by fans just speaks to the magnitude of his talent and the potential he had as a serious top star that went untapped. But once the Shield split up, the company had each guy pegged in their roles and refused to budge from those preconceived notions no matter how well they worked or didn't work. Too often, Ambrose was depicted as being daffy instead of dangerous, and it cost him virtually every time. When he finally did win the big one in 2016, it almost felt like it was a stopgap because of Roman's suspension and not just recognition for all his hard work. And in my opinion, the timing of the brand split completely diluted the impact of his reign. Considering how hard they worked at it, it's hard to tell if it was a calculated effort to keep him from outshining Roman or if the company was just that inept. Then again, that Stone Cold podcast, I mean, Oh, that did not help him out in the slightest. There was a time there for a while where you got out of the business, right? You just went back to a regular job. No. What are you reading? Needless to say, the John Moxley of 2023 is a far cry from the Dean Ambrose of 2014 through 2019. Since arriving in AEW at its inception, Moxley has more or less been free to do what he wants, which doesn't seem to involve goofy props or silly promos, and the fans seem to be cool with that. I don't doubt that yet another Shield reunion's on the table years down the line, but at this moment, it's easy to see that each member has been able to successfully carve out his own niche in the vast world of sports entertainment. Moxley just had to break out of that figurative prison in order to do so. Thanks for watching everyone. What did you think of Dean Ambrose's time in WWE? I want to hear about it in the comments section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and of course hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.